classical music, I mean, that should be one of your a go-tos for technique. I mean, there's, I mean, most of the jazz guys that I really like all have classical backgrounds, and their technique is just, you know, totally happening. I am so thrilled to bring you today's guest. He has played with Elvin Jones, Natalie Cole, Jason Marcellus, and so many other great artists. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contra Race Conversations, and we are chatting today with Edwin Livingston, who's one of the most active bassist recording artists out there today. And he's had such a fascinating career and such a fascinating background. He grew up in Dallas and was exposed to classical level bass playing after singing in choir and playing saxophone, studied classical bass performance in Kansas, and has had this wonderful journey, which we dig into from Austin to New Orleans and now to Los Angeles. We dig into how his journey has unfolded, some of the lessons learned, how he stays sane on the road, advice for younger musicians, so much good stuff. And I'd like to give a shout out to our sponsors, D'Addario Strings, Upton Bass, A440, and Robertson and Sons. We'll hear more from all of them later, but let's dive into our conversation with Edwin Livingston. I'm doing good. I'm doing good. How's your summer so far? So far, so good. Not too bad. You know, uh, I'm doing some traveling. I was just in New Zealand a few weeks ago. Wow. I'm not Japan on Wednesday, so it's been, you know, no complaints. It's good. What kind of a flight is L.A. to New Zealand? Is that a rough one? It is. It's fairly rough. I mean, it's, it, it could be worse. It's not as bad as going to, like, Indonesia, which is, like, Two or three flights and long layovers, but it's it's not bad. Like twelve, thirteen hours, you know. Yeah. Okay. Wow. That's uh. That well, Japan, Tokyo from here. What's what's Tokyo from L.A. How how long is that one? Kind of the same. It was it's about twelve, twelve, thirteen ish. Okay. You know, but it's fairly painless. Just a straight shot, or do you have to transfer when you're when? Yeah, this is better because I'm flying into, uh, flying into um, um, Haneda, so that's right there in Tokyo. Okay, as opposed to Narita, which is out like, like a few hours or something. Yeah, I was was confused that I've only flown into Narita. I've only been to Japan once before, but yeah, it's incredibly far away from Tokyo proper. It is, yeah, it's yeah, it, it's yes, <laughs> so I can say. <laughs> So it should be nice, yeah. Nice, nice. Is it is it just one date? Are you playing a few shows or? Oh, we have three nights. Uh, we get there Thursday, and then we rehearse Friday, Saturday, and play Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Okay. Yeah. Is that a pretty t- typical? Like, go to New Zealand? Is it sort of similar? Do three shows, three or four shows, and you're back. Well, New Zealand was just a one-off. We just did like a one ninety-minute set. So we we flew a half around the globe just to play ninety minutes. You know, it's it's kind of funny, but it's that happens kind of like a fair amount, you know. So there's uh, no you don't you must just give up on trying to adjust the time, right? There's just like time zones have no meaning for you on a day like that. I'm assuming. Oh no, no, you just got to stay up, stay up as long as you can the first night, and then try to make the best of it. Yeah, yeah. Is that? No- is that what you do? Is like just try to like adjust to that. I, I'm curious. I'm headed over to Italy uh, in a okay. month, and so I don't. I, it's been a while since I've been overseas, so I'm trying to remember. You just stay up until it's nighttime. That that time zone. You can stay up as long as you can, like at least to 10 p.m. or to midnight, so you can have at least a full, quasi full night of sleep. Because you know you may get up at 4 a.m. and you and then you're kind of kind of screwed the rest of the day. 
you know, because you're, you can, you're so whacked, you know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Man, what do you do uh, base wise for tra- Are you borrowing? Or are you do do you fly with your own? Do you have a removable neck? What what what's up these days? I do have a gauge trunk that I've used a lot, a whole lot. Which is uh, I bought I bought the gauge case in '99, uh, and I've used it since then. But it's been, it's been good because the trunk has been beat up so many times. I've had it repaired so many times. But the base has never been hurt. Mm. So, the purpose of it, I guess, you know, and the base has always been fine, so that's been good. But I haven't used my own base on an out of town date since 2015. And so Sorry. what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what I do now is I just get a, what we, as you're probably familiar with uh, the uh, base du jour, and uh, you don't know what you're gonna get. It's probably gonna be bad. You should just expect that. But I bring my own bow, so at least I have some some bit of comfort, you know. Yeah. It's got to be all over the place in terms of borrowing, I, I'm sure. You get, you must have some nightmare, uh, two inches off the fingerboard, and uh, you Especially, got... You know, like, yeah, people, because they have a rider, and I, you know, put in there specifically an antique, because they don't understand any of the a verbiage, you know, antique. Fully carved, three quarter size double base, uh, with with ebony fingerboard, and an adjustable bridge. So when I do get the base with the action, that's you know I, I can bring it down. But sometimes even base uh, that has a uh, I'm talking about that adjustable bridge, uh, you know, this and and the adjusters don't work. They're just frozen. They've been. It's just like you know right. you you're just sol. <laughs> yeah. Like, I guess they, I guess they uh, followed the letter of the rider, but not the spirit. Yeah, <laughs> to get that, the frozen that, bridge. Oh man. Uh, yeah, yeah, not happening. How often are you on the road? Like, like, are, are you doing fifty dates a year on the road? hundred dates a year on the road? What's what's it look like these days? Uh, it's been a little bit less as of late. Uh, maybe not a whole lot. Maybe like thirty. Okay. Days on the road right now, so it's nothing crazy like what it used to be, but. It's it's all very doable now, you know. What was it like? At, at what was what was your max? Were you on the road forty weeks a year? Well, yes, in a twenty fifteen, that was I think when my, that was out. I was out with the Melody Gardo, and that was for like three months at a time. That was that was long for me at the time, you know. And that's busing it every night. Sleeping on the bus, even sometimes no hotel rooms, just staying on the bus. So yes, yeah, you know, pretty, and that's when I had my own base, and my uh, the gauge flight trunk was on that one. So it was all very personal. Yeah, I can't imagine being on the road for that long. I, I there's probably a, an amount that's too much for you these days. Like I'm trying to figure that out for myself. Like I'll have a month where I, you know, if I go out one week a month, that's okay. Two weeks sure. a month, that started getting nuts, and more than that, I start to really dislike what I do. Totally. Well, you know, and, and also you got to really, kind of, I guess, kind of realize, you know, is this really worth it? You know, is the time worth it? Is the money worth it? Is it, you know, I, is you got to start weighing your option to see how much time you want to devote to this project, or you know, it's, you know, as you get older, you, you realize, you know what, I don't think I want to do that. I'm cool. I'll, I'll just, you know, gig around, you know, get around town for a little bit. I, I, oh, I totally. Somebody shared a, a technique that I've been using. I, I don't know if you've heard this before, but like you get an opportunity, evaluate it on a scale of one to 10, but you're not allowed to use seven. And I kind of like that because like an eight or not, you know, that's you're pretty excited about that. Because okay? like how many things in my life end up being a seven that I've said yes to? It's like, yeah, you know, totally. A friend of mine once told me there's uh, the rule of three. Uh, it, it had one. It has to be two of these three things. So either good people you're playing with, uh, good money, or good music. Mm-hmm. But either two of those three, then you should do the gig. And it's like, okay, that may work sometimes. Yeah, you know, it's not bad. I think that's a great rule, and I, I can't. I can think of so many gigs that have been one of the three, or maybe even zero, zero of the three. You know, earlier. Oh, I should have said no. 
I should have just said no. Oh man, th- th- I'm, so, I'm so glad to chat. Thanks, thanks so much for fi- uh, making the time to, ch- to chat. This this is going to be a blast. And sorry about reschedule. You know how schedules go. It's like you're you're good to go, and then San Francisco Symphony has been calling recently, so it's one of those you they call and say, "Can can you be there in 45 minutes?" I <laughs> say, oh. I'll ca- "Call the call the the lift line right now, or the lift plus, or whatever, and and I'll be there." That'd be an Uber XL. Yeah, Uber yeah. XL. That has been remar- that the Uber XL or the Lyft Plus. I've been using that here in San Francisco because I, I start to do the math and I realize a, a, a Lyft, pl- a, one of those large cars there and back is less than parking, and I don't have the frustration of parking. I could be like checking email in the back or whatever. And gas, so you're not worried about gas or parking. So that's yeah, I'm with you. Have you done that at all in LA or anywhere? You yeah, on occasion, yeah. It's, I mean. Especially when you have to go somewhere that's a drag and parking is like twenty five bucks, and you're like, it's not, it's not worth it, you know. Yeah, I, I have someone else do the driving and I'll be good. Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. And the frustration of being in a foreign town, like I remember renting a car in some place I'd never been, trying to drive, and even in the days before GPS, I had my Google Maps printed up, and I'm trying to figure out what the heck's going on. But yeah, you got the long page of all the directions. Like, okay, you know, yeah, that's it's funny how those days how. how have come and gone. It's like it's, you know, that was it. Yeah. Oh man, um, how long have you been in Los Angeles now, or based out of LA? I've been in in uh, here in LA since two thousand and five, and I moved here from New Orleans. And then, if I'm getting right, and then you were in Austin before that, and then from Dallas, right? From Dallas originally, and I spent five years in Austin, then six years in New Orleans, and now here in LA. Yeah. Did did uh, so uh, I I I never have any set questions for these things. I just like to chat, just like we're hanging out, having a coffee or a drink or whatever. But like t- maybe t- so. Grew up in Dallas, musical yeah. family. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I think more so on my mother's side. Uh, she had uh some brothers. She is the baby out of ten kids. So this is no, I guess kind of fairly common back in the day. You know, large families in the South, but. Uh, she had some brothers who were, I guess, uh, her also, but her brothers had this gospel group, uh, back in the sixties and the fifties called the gospel keynotes. And, uh, so I think most of my musicality and the musicianship uh, came from her side, or at least that's what I recollect, you know, as far as I know. What were you, did you get started on bass? Did you get started on guitar, piano? How'd that work for you? One of those, man. Uh, uh, I was in the choir, and uh, I was in the choir from uh, I guess first grade through uh, sixth grade. Uh, I grew up in a suburb of Dallas called Garland, and uh, I was in the All City Boys Choir. I was a second soprano back then. You know, things changed quickly after after that. You know, when everything goes south. But uh, it's funny because I wanted uh, my older brother played trombone in the band, and I'm uh, a few years younger than he is, and uh, I wanted to be in the band also. So uh, so, uh, band starts in sixth grade in Texas. So uh, I I told the I guess the band director I wanted to play the drums, of course, because that's what every kid wants to play, and uh, he said, "No, we have too many drummers. <laughs> Choose something else." So uh, then I chose a saxophone. And I played saxophone for all of middle school and most of high school. Uh, but for some reason, uh, I'm not sure what it was, but the bass, uh, I don't know. It was one of those things how you know you, how you hear a sound of an instrument and, and you're just drawn to it. Uh, that's what happened to me. I was drawn to the bass like in the eighth grade and started playing the electric bass in the jazz band. And, uh, it was funny because at the time I was taking private lessons on the saxophone, but my teacher was saying that, wow, you're not improving on the sax. Uh, why is that? I said, I don't know. I don't like the saxophone, maybe. And he goes, but then you should play what you want to play. And I said, I want to play the bass. He said, well, you should find a bass and and play that because this is not, the saxophone is not working. I said, okay. So then uh, I had to convince my parents to buy yet another instrument of that I may or may not you know, play so that's always a challenge when you're that age because you have no money and 
parents are like, yeah, you're not even playing the one that you have. Why would you want to play something else? Uh, but it, it finally, finally worked out. I convinced them to do that. And I got an electric bass. And I was playing in the jazz band there a little bit. And then I had to take lessons on that. And um, I was, at the time, you know, this was, you know, way before internet and all that. So we had to go through the newspaper or word of mouth from a saxophone teacher, like, oh, we need a bass teacher for my son. And um, uh, there was a music store called Brook Maze that was a, a, a large chain in Texas. And, uh, and, and there they taught lessons. And I was taken from a guitar player. And uh, she, it was mainly basic theory and some technique stuff, but I can't recall her name, but um, it was at some point uh, she said that I should really take lessons from a bass teacher. And I was like, yeah, that'd be great. Uh, do you know of any? <laughs> and then she goes, yeah, uh, I do know of a guy in the Dallas Symphony and his name is Roger Fertina. And he was the one that really tightened me up because even with him, I was playing the electric bass for, uh, for at least a couple of years, and I didn't start playing the string bass until the 10th grade, so later than a lot of people, I, I, as far as I know. But I was already 16 by the time I started playing the, uh, the double bass. And uh, he also told me, he goes, well, you're starting the double bass really late, so we're going to have to get you up to speed, though, so, you know. That was kind of the beginning of the, you know, the program. Did, did, um, did you, do you know at that point switching over the double bass music, was it for you? Did we, was that going to be it for your future or were you still thinking of some other options or? Uh, I don't know. It's, it was funny. Cause I think after, see, cause, uh, the high school I went to, there was no orchestra program. It was all band cause band is, you know, big down there. Uh, so we had a concert band and a symphonic band. I was in the symphonic band playing saxophone. And so they put me on double bass in the symphonic band. So I, I was dubbing tuba parts, you know, whatnot, some uh, trombone things. And uh, I thought that was cool. But even my teacher was like, my double bass teacher, Roger Fertina, was saying, yeah, we need to get you into an actual string orchestra where you can see exactly what's going on. So um, then I, I auditioned for the Greater Dallas Youth Orchestra. Uh, and that was when I really fully understood, like, okay, this is what a true bassist role is, you know. And it was it was great seeing all, you know, you know, peers, just like eight bass players, you know, playing at the same, you know, it's just like, oh, so this is what this really sounds like. Because I had some, you know, some horrible Englehart, you know, plywood bass that sounds like a, you know, like, like a, a truck with, you know, with, with cans attached to it. It was just like, but... You know, in a given context, it could sound really good. Mm -hmm. So, it was, I think at that point, then I realized, okay, this this is a lot of fun. Uh, I like the music. You know, it was, it was challenging, and that was when I realized I think I really wanted to do it for, you know, uh, to pursue that as a full time thing. Yeah, it's amazing what a difference peers make. You know, like flying solo on the double bass in, in concert band. And I've had some students who are doing that, you know, if they don't have a band program. But then, yeah, you get around a bunch of other people your age playing this thing. You learn so fast, the exponential oh, growth. Yeah. yeah, you get a chance to hear what it really sounds like in context. Like, wow, so this is, I mean, it's like if you're trying to do a, a symphony fantastique, you know, march to the scaffold by yourself. Okay, that's, yeah, it, it may work. But until you hear it in context with eight cats playing the same thing, it's like, wow, okay. You can feel it. You know, you can, wow, what this really is supposed to sound like. It, it's a huge difference, yeah. Were, uh, what was your undergrad in? Was it, it was music performance, right? What, double bass performance? Or? Yeah, performance, yeah, double bass, yeah. And what? that was uh, Kansas. Okay, Wichita, Kansas. So, so I, I've been to Kansas. You know, I'm from South Dakota, so I'm from like three boxes in the yeah, north. North. All right. Cool. You made it out. That's good. I, 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 I made it out, and here I am, California, enjoying the palm trees. Same here. Me too. I got out. Yeah. What, what was going to? Uh, why Wichita? What was going to school there like? And, and I know that's actually a pretty. Most people think of that as a pretty good college town, actually. Even though you look at a map and you see Kansas, wh why would I want to be there? I've heard, I've heard good things about it. 
Yeah, it, it's funny because the program is good, and uh, the teacher I think is, is still the same one. His name is Mark Foley, mm. and he uh, he is from Minnesota originally. I, went, I think he went to Eastman. Uh, so you know, great a great faculty, great player. Uh, the reason I went there is because I was trying to leave Texas, and I didn't want to, you know, because you no know, North Texas is was so close to me. But I was like, I was, you know, I was trying to leave everything that I had known. Like, look, I'm out. I, I want to leave. Uh, now it is when you get that age. And you're just like, you know, I, I've seen all this. I know these people. I want to go someplace, but no one knows me. So I can really start fresh and, you know. Oh, yeah. To, to prove yourself, so, so to speak. So just, you know. And uh, I had auditioned. Uh, to University of Miami, and I got in to Miami, but I didn't get a scholarship. And and at the time, my folks said, "Well, we, you know, we can't afford a private a private school." And I was like, "You know, that was, of course, when you're 18. That is what you don't want to hear." And uh, so then I was like, so I was I was looking around for other colleges, and uh, for some reason, Wichita State uh, popped up, and it was like, okay. That was it. Yeah. This episode is brought to you by Upton Base. And have you checked out this new travel base from Upton? Oh, my goodness. What a cool-looking design. What a great-sounding base. It's just totally remarkable. And the way that they're launching this product, it's just so perfectly Upton. It's uh, bold. It's innovative. you got to check out these videos of Gary Upton unfolding i don't even know how you describe it putting together i guess this travel base it takes almost no time it is in a samsonite piece of luggage i kid you not it is just the suitcase it is literally a suitcase base but it comes together and it's a real base it's a nice sounding base so cool just another example of the way in which upton is innovating and blazing new trails for the base community. So thank you for what you do, Upton, and thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. This episode is brought to you by Robertson and Sons Violin Shop, and they have been serving the string community and the base community for decades. Here's Don Robertson about the genesis of the Chromatic C extension. Were you the first to do that? As, as far as I know, I, I did the first chromatic extension on uh, on Paul Ellison's base. Yeah. We were up here several days, day and night in a row to figure this thing out, and we uh, came up with this swivel capo style, and uh, I, th I think Paul's was first, and um, Edgar Meyer was second when we did. Learn more about their chromatic extensions, bases they've got in stock, and everything else that they do at robertsonviolins.com. Classical bass player? I mean, you're playing in the orchestra back in, in Dallas area. Were you studying classical? Were you also playing jazz at that point when you started? What did that, what did that look like for you? Uh, it's funny because I started playing, I guess, I guess I started playing classical first because my teacher, Roger Fratina, and uh, but it's uh, there's no jazz program at Wichita State. It's, it's just you know music performance. So uh, it's all classical, and it, it was good for me because I was forced to audition. Well, I, I guess not forced, but I chose to audition for the Wichita Symphony Orchestra. Uh, just because you know it's like it's, it's an audition, so that's a little make you get your stuff together. Uh, and it's a paid gig, so you can, as opposed to just, you know, slumming around, you know, bumming all these, you know, no paying gigs. Uh, and it was, it was good for me because I had, I auditioned for Wichita Symphony um, uh, three times, and I made it the third time. Because the first time uh, I auditioned, I think it was for a sub position. And I think I subbed uh, for like the first year or two. And then I finally got a, you know, I made it for, I think, my last year there, if I recall correctly. But it was it was great because, I mean, the full repertoire, I had to do all the auditions, uh, all the all the, all the audition repertoire that is. So all the Beethoven's five, nine, you know, Mahler was two, you know, yeah. 
everything that has meat on it, uh, that's what we have to play. Of, of, of course, as you, because I know this podcast is like, man, it's the same stuff. We're all doing it, so it was great for me. Yeah, well, it's great. So, so you're there, you're playing Beethoven 5, 9, you're duck a duck Mahler, Mahler 2 and all that good stuff. How, when, did, when did jazz enter the picture? How did you go from playing Wichita Symphony to touring the world as a jazz artist? Well, it's, it's, it's like it's funny because you know how you have a lot of friends and uh, some uh, grad student friends and just friends in general because I would also attend the music festival in Arkansas over some of the summers and, and that was a classical thing. There's many other, there again, peers, man. Peers go a long way in, in kind of forging your own way. Uh, I met people from Chicago and from Michigan. And then uh, it's, it's like they were all saying how the scene, you know, it's like some were kind of disillusioned. Some were disillusioned with the whole uh, a classical thing, how you would audition, you know, and you would learn all this stuff and you would shed for months and months and months. And then you would either fly you and your base across the country and get a hotel room and then you do all this and then you don't get the gig. Yep. Or you pack up you and your base and drive clear across the country for this, you know, audition and you don't get the gig. So uh, I was like, wow, that's that doesn't really sound as appealing as I you know, as I thought it would, because I mean, I I did do several other auditions. I auditioned for Tulsa Phil once, and for a supposition for Dallas Symphony Orchestra also once. And it was just, I don't know. It it I kind of, I mean, I enjoyed it, but it just seemed like it was just too much for me. I was like, you know, this is if I don't get any kind of results that I like, or if I'm not really wanting to do all the driving and then playing the same stuff, you know, over and over and over and over, and over again for, you know, who knows how long. And so then I, 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 I kind of started focusing more on, on non-classical things, you know, at that point. But it was a very conscious decision that I had made, yeah, because it was, you know, it's, at some point you got to make a decision. You know, you got to either do it or not. Yeah, yeah. I know you're seeing the future, po- possible future ahead of you. And I got, I got to ask real uh, quick: uh, Was that the Hot Springs Music Festival that you did? Oh, that was what was Arkansas? It was called. It was um, not Music in the Mountains. I, I don't know. It was something. It, it was. It was. Uh, it was on the direction of of, of Doctor Carlton Woods, and I'm not sure if he's still uh, with us, but. It was, it, never again, being my former teacher, uh, Roger Fertino of the Dallas Symphony, he was uh, leading the bass section for that. And that was like a, a music, you know, like some music festival in Arkansas. And those was in the hills, nice western part of Arkansas was all green and hilly and, you know, yeah. Now, I was curious, I was curious, I've heard, I've and I've, I think that name rings such a strong bell I, I i i swear i've seen that festival you know it may be in my past but okay yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if it's still around now but it, it, it was back in the 90s yeah so so it, uh kansas studying in wichita and then uh seeing the path that might be in front of you and making a conscious choice uh was that what led you to austin uh what what drew you to austin essentially well uh as you know, like most bass players play all kinds of music because we like to play all kinds of music. I'm not just, you know, it's 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 always nice to meet uh, guys who or or women whomever uh, who like to play more than one thing. And being a bassist, we are afforded that ability because man, bass is the crux of so many kinds of music. So it's, it's I've always been a fan of that. And uh, I was playing in a rock band. At the same time, I was doing all the, the uh, doing a uh, rock band. At the time, I was doing all. Uh, I'm sorry, I was playing rock band. At the time, I was doing all the auditions, also just because you know it's fun and you know the, the hang is always good. Uh, and they were based out of 
uh, Denver at, at the time because I spent just a little bit of time in Denver for a hot minute and the band moved to Austin. You know, and I was like, well, you know, I'm from Dallas. I can go to Austin. Yeah, sure. Why not? So <laughs> I just, you know, packed up the van and drove from Colorado all the way down to Austin. Uh, and it was just one of those things, you know. And even there, as it's, it's, it's nice as a basis where we can always kind of pick up like a classical gig or like a pops concert, but you're still keeping up your chops, uh, you know, without being for the misery of <laughs> of driving across country and not getting the end of the gig. So it's it's you no know, kind of good that way. Oh yeah, totally. Well, it's funny the rock band thing. You know, like my first, I I got it's like so many bass players got in through electric bass. My first band was called Toxic Death. And we yeah. put out our, you know, our first album. I think track one was Fatal Sleep. Number two was Garments of Blood. And I was I was at a bass festival recently. We went around the table. There were eight of us sitting there, and they said, "How'd you get into bass?" And every person said, "Metal, metal, metal." Everybody, it was like, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not unusual at all. You know, it's great. Yeah. Nice, we're so open to do that. I th- I think it's great. Yeah. What was it like living in Austin? I mean, you think of that as like one of the, America's great music cities, and there's so much going on, a great local scene, good place to be based out of, I'm imagining. Totally. Oh, I mean, at the time, it was great because there, I said that was uh, a great scene. It was smaller then, of course. Uh, South by Southwest was always a big deal. You know, just tons of people, tons of music, uh, great bands, great venues to play, and, and a lot of great musicians also. I had a good cast come out of Austin, so it was it was just a great scene. Were you but mo- as you know, oh no, go! I was, I was just I was just sorry. I was just curious. Like local gigs mostly, or were you starting to do some touring and traveling, uh, maybe with the rock band or other acts? What the work situation look like? Uh work wasn't bad. I, I was doing some touring, but nothing crazy. Well, it's funny. We were in a double trio called Hot Buttered Rhythm. Speaking of you know bands that you play with. <laughs> And it was two bass players, two drummers, and two piano players. So it was, you know, <laughs> it's kind of funny, but we played it in, in Canada twice. We drove in a van from Austin to Canada twice uh, doing, uh, doing festivals up there and some along the way. We hit up, up the dating factory in New York a couple times, uh, festivals in Vermont, uh, then Toronto Jazz Festival, the Harborfront Festival, a uh, Montreal Jazz Festival. So that was when the touring, I guess, kind of started, like in you know, like the late '90s, and that was the uh, first taste of you know, wow, getting around. You know, there again, driving in a van is cool when you're in your 20s, but after that, you know, you're like, you know what, I'm not really digging this van thing, driving nine hours just to get to a hundred dollar gig. You know, you know. But it was cool then. It was great. No, I know that. Yeah. I know that. I know that lifestyle. I, I then you do the math on that hundred dollars for the gig. Come out, out to it's like oh, you yeah. know, one one quarter of minimum wage if you're lucky. Totally. What, what, there's another joke about uh, a guy with a like a twenty thousand dollar base and a five thousand dollar car going to a hundred dollar gig. It's like you know, it's just. You know, this just doesn't work. At some point, wow, this is not this is not working out. I don't know. Yeah, I think we've all had that moment of realization. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it happens. Well, so, so you're in so you're in Austin, and you know we're talking right now. It's late June in Austin right now. It's probably ninety degrees. So then you make oh. you make the move to somewhere even hotter, right? <laughs> well, it's just funny. Cause I- I some friends there and he said, hey, man, you should go down to New Orleans, man. They need bass players and the scene's cool. So I was like, uh, okay, sure, why not? So I uh, pack up the car again and drive drive over to New Orleans on the 10, you know, the I-10 East from Texas. And uh, it's there again. Once I got there, it, 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 it was a good scene. Uh, you know, of course, a ton of music. Uh there, I was really starting to do the international touring there with this with the, with the Afro Cuban band called Los Los Hombres Calientes, and that was led by uh, at the time Jason Marsalis, 
uh, one of the youngest, I guess the youngest brother from the Marsalis family, a uh, guy named Urban Mayfield on trumpet, and Bill Summers from Herbie Hancock, a uh, headhunters back in the day. And that was uh, one of my first touring gigs. Yeah. So you're starting, so New Orleans is the home base, but you're starting to spend more time on the road at that point. Yes, exactly. And, and, and I think, did you say that you moved to L.A. in 2005? Uh, was that, because I mean, I start to think Hurricane Katrina, that's right around, was that a part of the move or? Well, it's funny, man. It was, well, funny and kind of ironic for me. Uh, I left New Orleans in like a February or March of 05. And, and, and uh, Katrina happened in September. So just after I had left and and then I'm watching the news and everything that I, I had seen and had lived in was all flooded. It was really, yeah, really horrible, actually. But it was, uh, yeah, it, it was really ironic. So I actually haven't been back to New Orleans since Katrina. I'm assuming you've been back to play or for, to visit to... What's what's um what's the how is the music scene? I mean, we're we're a while out from Katrina now, but what a devastating! I mean, about as devastating as I think could happen to a city. Like, how what's the music scene look like now versus pre Katrina? Do, do you still see an impact going back there? Or well, it's 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 funny. I, I haven't actually been back to New Orleans proper. Really? Okay. Thanks. I've played around there, like, you know, you know, various gigs would go through either through there or maybe Baton Rouge or, you know, drive through there or something. But I, 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 I haven't set foot in New Orleans since, which is, which is sad because I, I like it down there. But I, I, I play with cats from there, like, all the time, and they say that it's gotten better. Okay. But, uh, you know, it's, yeah, it, it was a drag. Because I remember... While I was living there, uh, I would see Dave Anderson because you know he's been on your show. Oh yeah, oh great! There again, great guy. You know, and oh, and the, yeah. he was always cool to me. You know, great, nice Prescott bass. You know, giant. So it was, it was, yeah, it, it was cool down there. But oh. I haven't, unfortunately. Oh, I love Dave Anderson. One of the one of my favorite people. And you want to talk about long drives? You know, he had this. Big old full size van that he'd drive from New Orleans to Medford, Oregon, every summer to play in the Brit Music Festival. Can you imagine what kind of a drive? Maybe, maybe you've done that drive, but that's well, see. It's funny because my other teacher did that, or or, or uh, he did the same thing. It's it, it's it's cool how bass players over the summer they just like look, you know, I'm gonna get as far away as I can from my home and just drive and play whole new environment, make, you know, make a little music and, you know, it, it, it seems very common for bass players to do that. So it's, it's cool. Oh yeah. Well, Dave, I know Dave loved getting out to Oregon. He said, you know, New Orleans in the summer, it was like, have the air conditioning full blast in the car and run the bass as fast as possible from the car into the venue. And yes, that's, just, uh, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it wasn't because of Katrina, but you moved out that same year. Uh, was that just L.A. just seemed like the next step for you career-wise, or what drew you out there? Well, funny you say that. It's, uh, it's, it's, I, I'm not sure for other bases, but it, it sometimes a move depends upon a loved one. And at the time, I was, I, I was dating a, a woman who was living in L.A., and uh, she said, you, you know, you should move out. You should move to L.A. because New Orleans is just, you know, you should just leave. It's getting tired down there. The gigs are, you know, are, are all dried up. I was like, well, you know, she has a point. And uh, I was either going to either move to New York or to L.A. And um, uh, she was living in L.A. So I was like, yeah, you know, L.A. sounds like a good place to go. So, so there again, I, I drove my... Uh, 1990 Volvo V70 wagon with U-Haul trailer. There again, all on the I-10, straight across. But it's it's funny. Uh, on that drive, uh, I think my AC went out in Texas, and man, I had to get it. It was either that, either that, or like a alternator or something. And that was. The trip had just started, of course, and then I'm stranded in Texas. Like, wow, I just I just left here, and now I'm back. And then you know, got that fixed. Then the the, the, the drive across Texas 
takes forever. It's like you know, longest or just long drive, all the same state. Just a horrible drive. I mean, it's 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 beautiful drive. It's you know, pretty scenery, but it's just a drag if you're, you yeah. know. It's like I forget how many miles it is across Texas, but it's like, you know, yeah. Well, at least it was February. If the AC went out, you know that that dri- I remember driving with my family from South Dakota to Los Angeles. My family down in SoCal, and and oh. and and no AC in the car. Right, this is like late oh. '80s or something, and the cold washcloths on the forehead. And stuff. Yeah, it's 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 like funny, man. The things you do as a bass player, man. You just, like you know, you just got to get in the car and start driving, and you know. But yeah, it's true. Very true. So, so you thought about New York, moved out, and I'm I live in California because of a woman too. You know, my my wife got a gig out in San Francisco, so here I am, and I'm totally. very very happy out here. But but I think most people who are working in jazz, you know, think about New York or live in New York for a period of time, and totally. and you know a lot of some similarities, obviously New York, LA, two of the the two biggest cities, but differences too. Like whenever anybody's going to the Midwest and I lived in Chicago, Illinois for years and years, I tell them to go to a 440. If they're looking for a bow, if they're looking for a bass, if they need some repairs, then if they have a student who's looking for an instrument, a 440 has been serving the community for years and years. They're located just west of Wrigley Field, in beautiful Chicago. They do great work, and they've been a big supporter of bass events over the years, whether it's the Chicago Bass Festival or really any bass event. A 440, you guys rock. Check them out at a440violinshop.com. Hi, this is David Moore. I'm a professor at the USC Thornton School of Music as well as a bassist in the LA Philharmonic. Gosh, I've been using um, Diodario Kaplan's for the past several years, the, the heavies especially in the orchestra as well as on the bass that I have at USC. I just really like the the versatility that they give, especially dynamically. They just respond well in soft dynamics and well in loud dynamics that can really um, take anything that I can dish out, and they're just a really well-balanced string across all of my instruments. I've also used the Zyx strings more kind of in an experimental way. I'm honestly looking for sort of the the combination in the sweet spot between the two of those because I really like the the ring and the response and the tension of the Zyx with um, some of the more conventional characteristics of the Kaplan's. So I'm hoping that that's something that's in the works someday in the future. Hope that helps. Life as a jazz artist based in Los Angeles versus maybe people you know in New York. What are, what are some of the similarities, differences? I know there are a ton of, of both. Right. But. Well, let's see some of the th- some of the few things off the top. Uh, I mean, it's well, I think for me the first uh, bit of rationale on. I had was I'd rather starve in LA than starve in New York because the winters would be uh, more palatable in LA than in New York. So I was like, you know what, if I'm going to starve, I'm going to go to LA. So that was also part of my thinking in, in, in doing that. But it's a, uh, I think there's a, a lot of opportunity here because we have, of course, the film industry, tons of session work. I want to say tons of session work. I mean, you know, it's 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 hard to put it, or it's hard to quantify how much session work that you're gonna do. But I, I think you have have the option if those options are afforded to you. You know, to do a lot of different kinds of things in LA, and that's like TV work. A session work in orchestras, which I've done some of that on a lot of pop things or for like so like pop strings, but nothing, uh, nothing hardcore classical, but uh, but still you know still uh, all arco stuff, but you know pads or some you know some funk lines for a string orchestra or whatever. Uh, like I said, all those TV shows, uh, you know, award shows. Folks who come to town and eat strings, you know, because I did something a few years ago with uh, with for some Christmas special, and they wanted strings, so it was cool to be contracted for that, you know, you know, it, but it just varies, and I think there is more of that here than than in New York, 
but uh but it does seem like the hardcore the hardcore jazz scene does seem to be like it's always been east coast for some reason uh but it's funny a lot of those cats are heading west now because they're just tired of the you know just tired of the city the city's hard man you got to be hardcore to live up there so it's some cats are just tired of the struggle they just forget about it i'm going to la you know yeah hauling the base on the subway and all that sort of stuff you know that's uh that, that's a grind I was hanging up there, and it's like, man, you leave Smalls at, like, 4 a.m., but, like, you don't want to have to drag your base five five blocks over, then go to the stop, then wait 45 minutes for the train to come. It's like, you know what? At 4 a.m., no, I'm not I'm, I'm not feeling that, you know. <laughs> but, yeah. How, how do you think you're – so you've got – I mean, you've got this extremely – strong classical background classical bass major playing in wichita symphony and all this how do you th- this is a super broad question but how do you think that helped you in your career that 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 deep technical knowledge that knowledge of the bow all that how how is that paid dividends uh you know these years hence oh it's well it's it's, it's funny for me i tell my students all the time uh Classical music, I mean, that should be one of your uh, go-tos for technique. I mean, there's, I mean, most of the jazz guys that I really like all have classical backgrounds, and their technique is just, you know, totally happening. And when I see some of these guys with like, you know, really poor left hands, and the, it, you know, it's just like uh, misshapen fingers. It's like, you know. Man, had you guys studied classically, I think this is my personal, you know, highly biased opinion. I, I think, man, if you haven't studied the Samandel book, I think you're missing out on a whole aspect of playing the instrument. You know, because some cats, you know, they say, oh, we're jazz. You don't use a bow in jazz. Because, except for the last note of a ballad or something. I'm like, man, that's that's totally, total, total misinformation. I mean, you should use, I mean, look at Paul Chambers. Paul Chambers is one of the baddest Arco soloists, you know, period. You know, yeah. him and Jimmy Blanton played with the bow back in the of the, uh, the 30s or you know, the 20s. You know, it's like, I mean, for me, uh, uh, the knowledge of the technique that you would need to play the bass well, properly and in tune, you can only get that from classical music, I think. That's my personal opinion. That's just me. Or or uh, Richard Davis, monster Arco I just saw all the stuff with uh, him and Gary Carr back in the 60s, you know, uh, those videos. I mean, you know, it's like those cats can play, you know. I've, I've thought about this so much. You know, back in DePaul, I used to teach at DePaul in Chicago, and I was I – was, this is kind of an old model, but they, 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 they're doing it where – if you're a jazz player, you study with the quote unquote classical guy for a couple of years and then you take jazz. And, and so I was that guy, right? So you come in as a jazz major, you'd end up working with um, Kelly Siller, whoever was teaching there at the time, but you'd work with me at the same time. And I always struggled with like what to do with, with like, sh- and whether, I guess really the question for me was whether to think about repertoire, like should I, what's the benefit of working on Beethoven five or nine with these guys or should I be working on scales with them? How do you think rap has helped? You know, or what? Just what are your thoughts on that? See, it's, it's funny. See, I, I guess it depends when, when they learn the stuff. Because I was uh, given this information when I was in high school, and that was my teacher. I mean, I play French bow, you know, and the thumb has to be, you know, curved, and that is so hard for people to learn as they get older. It seems like for some reason, or it, it's either that or they don't want to devote the time to learn because it is hard to, you know, it's the bow is going to fall out. Feel like every time you pick up the bow, it's like, I can't do it. I was like, well, it's not going to happen overnight. I mean, it, it, this will take you years to get this, you know, together. And uh, some cats don't want to put in the time or the effort. So I think it depends upon uh, who your student is, who you're trying to teach and what they want to get out of it. But I mean, yeah, I, it's, it's, that's that's a great question, and what I would say is I would find stuff that they like to play. That's what I try to do to a student who may not be keen on on playing the repertoire or a certain sound. 
and like the stuff that I liked back then when I was younger, and I was like, and I still do. I mean, Brahms Four is a monster. I mean, it's, you can't get better than E minor. I mean, that's like that's a bass player's dream, you know. And all the because you some hemiola, that's 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 nothing. That's same stuff as in jazz. Two against three, you know, it's all it's all it's all in there. So what I try to do is find something they could kind of relate to. So, and it'll, you know, and it's fun to play, you know, so I'm thinking anything by Prokofiev, I'm a big fan of, because this, it's got a certain vibe and a certain sound that's like, wow, this is, it's out, but it sounds good. You know, his Romeo and Juliet, that's been my favorite free ever, because the bass is just, boom, boom, yep. boom. I mean, now who's not going to dig that? I mean, that's, I, I thought it was great when the first time I played it. So I would try to find things that they would like to play. And in doing so, I, I do try to incorporate the bow because I think it's an essential part of the instrument. I mean, for me, you should, of course, you should use the bow. It, it's part of the bass. Yeah, there's no difference for me. And that classical training, I, I, I figure that's got to have helped you or help a lot of people with injury prevention. That's something I've been talking with people a lot about. I was at a base camp this past week Golden Gate Base Camp here in San Francisco, I did a class about bass in the body. So there were about 18 teenagers all in there. And I said, who's in pain right now from playing the bass or was had pain? And every single one of those kids raised their hand. And, you're, and, and it was like talking to a bunch of 70-year-olds. They're like, oh, I got lower back pain. I got my shoulder hurt. I'm getting pain in the wrist. And so it's like, man, it just made me think how important that is. That, that is. Um, have you struggled with that? Or like, do you think your classical playing has helped with that? I mean, well, it's it's funny because I'm there again. I, I guess I'm kind of old school because my teacher is kind of old school. Yeah, and uh, I stand when I play. For mo I mean, for like ninety five percent of my playing, I, I stand. So I guess I'm not very comfortable when I sit. But it depends upon the stool also. If the stool is of a certain height and a certain you know, uh, I don't know, comfort level, then yeah. I'm, I'm I'm probably fine with it. But I, I stand like ninety five percent of my time. And uh, and uh, I can't put a lot of weight on my right leg if you do it properly, because you know the old school guys say you, you should be able to stand with your base, you know, hands free. You, know, you put the lower bottom about the lower about against your left knee, and your right leg should just be around here, and your hands should be up, and the base should be able to stand up, you know, all by itself, leaning into you, uh, and. I've run into a couple of bishops back in the day, uh, but that was mainly from a tendonitis, and that was from, I can't remember what it was, but it, it was something during the, the time you had to play a lot. Yeah. It's probably during a, a recital period, and I was playing the Hindemith, and it was kicking my butt or something, or, or you know, just most of the health things I've had problems with have not been nothing, uh, have been nothing major, I can say, uh, and that I've been able to recover from. Uh, but it's been a pretty limited, actually, because I, you know, I have a good posture when I play, a good left hand technique. Uh, you know, I try to keep, you know, of course, a um, healthy diet. But I, I mean, I try to instill in the students that you know, if you guys, you know, a proper technique will can only help you. I mean, they don't. I sometimes have a hard time understanding that, well, you know, do I have to do it like this or that? Well, I mean, these guys play well, you know, they do it like this. I mean, I don't know. You tell me, you know, if, 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 if it doesn't sound good and that's how you're playing, then I would change it. Yeah. You know, I mean, there are, I've only seen a few guys with poor technique who sound really good. And, and that's great for those guys. I say, well, okay, well, that's a special case because this guy is just, has whatever he has a gift who knows but you sir uh i would learn the proper technique first and then you know get it together because i mean there's no guarantees but you know for sure for sure man and and just like thinking of being healthy or just like in general like like being on the, and you're on the road less than you were but you're still on the road a lot how do mm -hmm. you maintain some sense of normalcy or keep from going crazy or falling into uh just 
bad habits on the road. I think, you know, that's a, that's a, a time honored, you know, musicians have struggled with that for so long. What, what have you done that's worked? Uh, <laughs> that's worked. I don't know. Or maybe what have you done that hasn't worked? Could be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. That's a good question. I, well, it's funny. One thing that you have, you have to be able to break routine. You know, you should be able to, I mean, when I get up to a new city or go out in a new city, I mean, walk. That's the best thing you can do is but man, leave the hotel and walk. Go see places, walk as far as you can. It's like, I forget one time we were in in Russia. I mean, we walked all over the place just because we were, first of all, we didn't want to take a taxi because we didn't have any rubles. And we didn't want to give out our credit card information. So it's like, you know, guys, we're just going to walk everywhere because it, it's, first of all, it, it's good for us. And, and two... But we may be safer, so that's what we just you know walk everywhere. And I think a walking is is easy to do. If I mean, for those who can't do that, you know, it's totally user friendly. Uh, uh, how how they say um, uh, low stress is involved in that, or you know, as or, or low impact, I should say. You know, that's the first thing I would do. And just, you know, if, if if you can't find a gym there in the hotel, then go to that. You know, that's the easy. There again, same thing, treadmill, if, if the weather's bad. Or just any kind of light cardio. And if not that, then do it in your own hotel room. If, if there's space, something. Yeah. But move, yeah. Around, move around and then don't fall asleep the moment you get it. Yes. At, at, at 11 a.m. or something like that. Yeah. Fight the urge to sleep because you will want to go to sleep. Yeah. Oh man. Uh, so so I I hope that I hope that to see you in person uh, one of these days again. We were, ran into each other. Bass player was it? Bass player live in Hollywood. Yeah. You and me and Brandino. I think we were chatting. Yeah. Okay. Right. Brandino. That's right. <laughs> well, I'd love to. Next time we see. Are, we're, yeah. The time. Uh, it'd be great. Like I, I love doing round twos and round threes with people. And I, and, and you know, there's, there's, there's no way we can even possibly dig into there. You know, we're, we've gone through like 1% of what we could probably talk about, but, sure, but, sure, I, yeah. but I usually, I usually wrap up with some sort of advice for young people or advice for your younger self topic. And it could be interesting because you, you definitely, at least from an outsider's perspective, if I look at Edwin at Wichita state, you know, studying classical bass and then, Natalie Cole and all the myriad other people you've played with. Um, those seem like quite different career trajectories. Um, but obviously there's a lot in common. Like if you could go back and talk to 18, 19 year old Edwin, uh, what might you tell him? It's, it's funny. I think about that quite often. And I would say uh, it's funny cause I was checking out your Alex Hanna mm -hmm, mm -hmm. talk a few minutes ago, just, you know, doing a little prep, you know, because it's, it's good to be prepped before you do something. Uh, it's it's like, like like all those Friday nights when you are out with, with your boys. You know you should be you should take a few of those more Friday nights off and and get into the shed. You know so that was I, I mean had I you know gotten in the shed what well, I, I, I say. Seriously, in the shit that is. I mean, I've always practiced, but you know how you should really devote like so, some actual quality time with the metronome. That's I would say, man, go back, play the metronome every day because that's what I, I do that now when I can. I mean, it's just it's only going to help you. And being a bassist, I mean, uh, all we have is like tone and time. If you have a great tone. Folks are going to remember that. And if you have great tone and your time is good, I mean, you, I mean, that's like half the battle or more than half the battle, really. So, yeah, I, I would go, i say shed more intently, you know. So some, yeah. some, fr some Fridays out with the boys is okay, but maybe not, maybe not as many. <laughs> yeah, you know, and this is, it's the same thing. It's, 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 it's the same quandary of like, well, you know. Man, I want to go hang out. You know, she, she wants to go to a movie. Maybe she go to a movie tonight, which is great. We, we all live our lives, but 
knowing full well that at some point you're going to be asked to play something that you can't play. And had you spent that one little bit of time practicing, this may be the, you know, the time to do it then. Because as you get older, you're going to start to work. You're going to start to gig. And so you're going to start to make money. And you're just like, man, I really should have practiced more when I was, you know, 18, 19, 20. Because now, you know, time, time, is, uh, time is very precious. So we should take advantage of it when we have it. There's a season in life for everything. And like that, that, that 18, 19, 20, that's such a good time to make incredible progress, it seems. Totally. I agree. You give me fever when you're kissing me. Fever when you hold me tight. Fever in the morning. Fever all through the night. Everybody's got the fever. Something we all learn. Oh, fever's not such a new thing. Yeah, but what a lovely way to burn. Edwin, thank you so much for chatting. And folks, learn more about everything he's up to and follow along with him on the road at his website, edwinlivingston.com. And thank you so much for listening to these episodes, folks. I get such a kick out of chatting with all these different guests from all different walks of life. And it was great to meet Edwin in person back at Bass Player Live in 2017. Definitely do round two at some point in the future. And I get so inspired and I learn so much from Edwin and from all the other guests on this show. So I really appreciate you joining me in this journey. And if you want to reach out, feedback at ContrabasseConversations.com will put you in touch with me. And I respond to each and every message I get. And that helps guide the show. We've got all kinds of different directions we're exploring here on the podcast. And I'm just so excited to be involved in this. Contrabass Conversations is produced by Michael Cooper, Steve Hinchy, Trevor Jones, and Mitch Mooring. Mitch is making beautiful bases in the Dallas area, just east of Dallas. Learn more at MitchMooring.com. Thank you also to Krista Copper for cataloging and organizing all of these back episodes. I'm your host, Jason Heath, coming to you each and every week from San Francisco, California. And we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum.